Um, welcome everybody to today's uh, lecture in our Deccan webinar series um, from Malabar to Coromandel, which may be better titled from Malab from Kongtan to Coromandel. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to um, say, you know, that our thoughts are with everybody in India right now going through the pandemic. Um, and uh, we hope that um, today's lecture will uplift us with some beautiful buildings. Um, and um, I, my name is Vivek Gupta and I'm one of the co-organizers of this series. Um, and I would like to introduce um, Abhishek Mehta, who is a DHF, Deccan Heritage Foundation UK board member and the founder of Blue Lotus Investment Firm, um, Abhishek. trying to spotlight you. Oh uh, yeah, he is. But the microphone, it's unmuting. Yeah. Yes, you are. Great, thank you. I was just waiting for a host unmute. Mm -hmm. Apologies for that. Thank you so much, Vivek. At the outset, I too would like to express my best wishes for those around the world, and particularly in India during this pandemic, which continues to be an enormous challenge. Please stay safe and healthy. Today, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Julia Hagewald. One cannot distill her wonderful work and accomplishments in a brief introduction, but I'll attempt to do so. Dr. Hagewald is professor and head of the Asian and Islamic Art History Department at the University of Bonn in Germany. For 12 years until 2014, she was the director of the Emmy Nother Research Project on Jainism in Karnataka. She has authored numerous books, including many on Jain history and culture. She is a definitive expert on Jainism. In fact, she's an expert in many areas, a BA in Nepali language and art, a master's from the Oriental Institute of the University of Oxford, and a PhD in the history of Indian architecture. It is inadequate to put into words how much research Dr. Hagerwald has done and how many accolades she has received. And speaking with Dr. Hagerwald, I learned of her 10 year adventure in writing her book on Jain temple architecture in India. This dedication is inspiring. Today, we are celebrating Dr. Hagerwald's guidebook, The Jaina Tradition of the Deccan. Dr. Hagerwald's lecture today is on Jain temple architecture of coastal Karnataka, coastal Karnataka which focus on focuses on climatic dependencies and artistic freedoms. When Helen kindly asked me to introduce Dr. Hegewald today, I of course accepted with delight. But in learning about what Dr. Hegewald has done, it really hit me. Dr. Hegewald is German and she's one of the world's leading Jan experts. Now, I am Jan and growing up in a Jan family, I realized a lot of our traditions and rituals oftentimes had little context Someone like Dr. Hegewald had a burning desire to understand another culture. And I think that's beautiful, especially during times like these when there's a tendency to sometimes think and act inwardly. We miss the broader perspective that is humanity. I thank Dr. Hegewald for sharing her passion, knowledge, and her love of Jainism. Dr. Hegewald, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so very much. Uh... Abhishek Mehta, thank you Abhishek for these very, very kind words, much too kind. Um, thank you for introducing me, for supporting the publication and the Deccan Heritage Trust, which uh, does such uh, amazing work. Um, I would of course also very much like to um, thank Helen Phelan and Vivek Gupta for inviting me to speak in the series and for organizing the lecture series, continuing even into the autumn and the winter as I've just heard mm, now. I would like to thank the Deccan Heritage Foundation, the Center of Islamic Studies in Cambridge. Of course, um, special thanks go to Her Royal Highness in uh, Mysore and the Sri Shikandadatta Narasimha Bodhiya Foundation in Mysore, who have kindly supported this um, undertaking, this lecture series, and made it uh, possible. Thank you to everybody. I feel very honored to be uh, invited. Um, I will switch on my PowerPoint to um, share my images with you. I hope that's visible to everybody. Um, 
The paper presentation today, as we just heard, um, celebrates and uh, launches um, the latest uh, guidebook uh, in the Deccan Heritage Foundation series, uh, authored by me, and it focuses on the Deccan, Deccan High Plateau and uh, coastal Karnataka, the Jaina tradition of this uh, region. Um, I would not just like to present um, a summary of the book, but use examples of temple architecture um, discussed, of course, in much more detail in the publication. And I would like to use them to um, discuss the connection between climatic dependencies and artistic freedoms, which are particularly pronounced, I would argue, or very, very obvious in this uh, region, the region of the Deccan Plateau and um, coastal Karnataka. So I've widened the scope a little bit. I've also, I've, I'll include a little bit of material on the high um, plateau, the dry plateau of the Deccan Plateau um, to contrast the two regions, which I think uh, makes my argument uh, even um, clearer. My interest in dependencies versus freedoms, which might at the first moment maybe seem a little bit odd, derives from an interdisciplinary and trans-regional research cluster at the University of Bonn, which has started in 2018, in which I'm involved as principal investigator. And this cluster examines um, slavery, but also extreme forms of dependency much more widely. So it's called the Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies, but my work is not on slavery, but on dependencies, which are very interesting to... We lost you. We lost. Julia, I hate to interrupt you, but we cannot hear you. Yes. Um, we cannot hear you. Um, Neil. Neil. You, I think you need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm asking Julia to unmute herself. She has to do it from her side. I've done it. I think I've done it. Is that right? Yeah, yes. that's fine. Can you hear me now? Sorry. We are yeah. dependent on sound, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you have dependencies everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it in, so my work there uh, inquires into the limitations posed by dependencies, but also researches the freedoms which can still be found in situations of extreme dependency. Okay, let's move to India. Um, in my paper today, I wish to discuss how architecture is strongly dependent on and has been has always been adapted to climatic conditions. The geogra geography, but in many ways also the local climate determines the availability of local construction materials. This dependency on climate and building resources will be contrasted with the freedoms and choices which are still available to architects, master builders and artisans in their design process. I want to discuss questions of dependence and freedom by examining Jaina temple building traditions from the Deccan region and I've chosen two closely related but widely differing areas on the one hand, above the Drekan High Plateau, which is dry. This is a photograph from uh, close to uh, Shavana Bergola, and then the more humid, low-lying, wet um, Western Indian coastal belt uh, exemplified in this photograph below. I would like to start with a few words in, uh, of introduction uh, to Jainism and Jaina history in the region. Um, as so far, this lecture series has tended to focus slightly more maybe on Hindu and Islamic traditions, of, although, of course, we have seen uh, wonderful Jain temples already. Jainism finds its origins in eastern India and Bihar in the 5th, 6th century BCE, and according to legend, uh, due to a severe drought and a resulting famine, um, the Jaina community moved um, away um, uh, from the third century BC onwards, um, uh, migrated uh, from the region um, and along the way, at least according to legend, the community split into two sections. One part remained in the north but migrated further into the west and the second portion allegedly led by the famous teacher, the Acharya Bajrabahu, went south into the Deccan. These southern migrants are believed to have created the Digambara form of Jainism, the space or sky clad, uh, which means really naked followers, the Digambaras, as opposed to the 
white or cotton clad um, Shwetambaras, um, as you can see the gentleman on the left, um, which is more prominent in the north and west of the country. According to legend, Badra Bahu um, died a voluntary religious death by strictly supervised starvation known as Salekana in the Dekani um, pilgrimage center of Shwana Belgola, probably in about 298 before the common era. Through inscriptional references, literary works, as well as sites and edifices allegedly visited by him, um, this story has been ingrained in the religious memory of the region. And on the left, for instance, we can see his um, so-called meditation cave, the place where, according to legend, he um, reached Kivanyana, full knowledge, full enlightenment. And we have these two feet, soles of the feet. They are not really foot imprints marking the actual spot. However, it is actually more likely that wandering um, or oh, actually, I, I should also explain the one, uh, the photograph on the right. So Badra Bahu um, allegedly was accompanied by Chandragupta Maurya, the, um, the grandfather of, um, of, of um, Ashoka. Um, and it's interesting that we have some narrative panels. Actually, these are 48 panels and we have another set um, that date from the 12th century and are found in the, um, in the Chandragupta Basadi on Chandragiri. And these narrative panels um, kind of narrate the story of Badra Bahu, the, the famous Jain teacher accompanied by uh, Chandragupta uh, on their way to the South. Now this is a legend and this is very present uh, at all places and the story keeps on being repeated. Historians, um, would probably say that it's actually more likely that wandering Jaina monks transmitted the religion over centuries from Bihar through Orissa into Tamil Nadu in the early centuries BCE, that it reached, um, that Jainism reached Tamil Nadu before the end of the fourth century BCE, and that Jainism spread from Tamil Nadu to Karnataka in the early centuries of the common era. We assume that it probably reached Karnataka in the second century CE. Various Jainism was gradually losing influence in areas of northern India, other than Rajasthan and Gujarat, where they played, continued to play a really important role in the early centuries of the common era. It continued to flourish in the southern states, especially in Karnataka. And this appears to have been due to the patronage of a number of local rulers. Um, from the mid of the fourth century, Jainism definitely experienced great support by the Western Gangas, the contemporary Kadambas, and the Western um, Chalukyas. And uh, Shwana Belgola developed into a prominent pilgrimage center, probably already in the fifth century. And on this uh, left, you can see some early remnants of um, Jain inscriptions. Um, uh, scraped into the natural surface of um, Chandragiri and Vidyagiri at Shana Belgola, and we have many of these foot representations marking spots of enlightenment by both Jain ascetics as well as also the laity. And while traces of Jaina structures and inscriptions dating from the 7th century have been preserved, the earliest statues and temple buildings date from the 8th to 10th centuries, and the image on the right is a good example um, because it shows the three shrines of the so-called Chandragupta Basadi, um, which dates from the middle of the 9th century. The rest of the temple was added later in the 10th and 12th centuries. The carving of the colossal statue of, of Gomatishwara, which you can see here at Shrana Belgola by Chaman, Chamundaraya, the famous general of Marasimha II and Rajamala IV in the 10th century, marks probably the senis of Jainism and its influence in Karnataka and South India in the 10th century. It's, um, it's a monolith, it's one single piece of stone, it's about 18 meters high, and it was probably consecrated in 981 CE. Large numbers of Jaina settlements and temples, and the Jain temples in the region are known as Basadis or Bastis, emerged in Karnataka at this time. The term Basadi or Basti derives from the Sanskrit word Vasati, meaning a residence of God. 
The situation started to change from about 1000 CE onwards when the fortunes of Jainism started to wane also in southern India. From the middle of the 12th century, Jainism began to be threatened by Hindu groups such as the Vaishnavas and Sri Vaishnavas, um, so Bhaktas, by Vira Shaivas, and in the northern Deccan region also by Muslim migration into the area. At this time, many Jaina sacred edifices were destroyed or absorbed and transformed by incoming religions and their converts. So we have a lot of um, desecrated, beheaded um, Jain statues or images which were at least removed from their pedestals, um, um, preserved at many Jain sites. But it's interesting that Jain temples very often were actually reused. They were taken over and converted, which makes them very, I mean, which has preserved them and also shows very interestingly the differences between religions and between ritual use. In the south, the Jains only kept a backing in the modern state of Karnataka, where they continued to be important and influential, at least in a number of small places. And this is definitely the region around Shrana Belgola on the Deccan Pai Plateau, as well as in the remoter coastal strip beyond the Western Ghats, the two areas which we'll be focusing on today in this presentation. And in these areas, Jainism still uh, flourishes to the present day. So let's now examine the local geography and climate and the availability of building materials in these two regions. As pointed out at the start uh, of the presentation, Karnataka at least falls into two uh, distinct geographic and climatic zones. Um, the first is uh, shown in these images here. Um, the modern state capital of Bangalore lies on the Southern Plateau, which is a relatively dry highland. Um, illustrated in these photographs and in those parts where irrigation is available as down below here, for instance, one finds, finds cultivations of ragi, which is a form of millet, paddy coconut trees and areca palms. But otherwise, as is shown above, um, the region is a high desert with large stretches of really relatively barren terrain. To reach the coastal region of Karnataka, one has to descend a steep mountain ridge, the Sayadri Hills, and at the bottom lies the Kanara region, a long and narrow lowland which stretches for about 300 miles from north to south. The region is known as Kanara, but also Dakshina Kannada, Tulunadu, Tuludesha. There's a variety of terms used. The region has its own local languages, Tulu and Konkani, and a unique culture which shows lots of borrowing between religious groups and cults. This narrow strip of relatively level land is watered by a number of streams and consequently very fertile, as you can see in the photograph down here, particularly when contrasted with the images which we just saw before. The Sayadri Hills, um, ranging from 2,000 to more than 8,000 feet in height, present a strong barrier for the heavy monsoon clouds approaching via the sea. And this causes generous and regular rains to go down over the coastal belt. This has favored the growth of dense evergreen forests, consisting primarily of teak and sandalwood. Otherwise, these are accompanied by bamboo groves, cultivations of coffee, cashew nut, areca nut, tea, cardamom, coconut, banana, uh, often in very large plantations. So it's an extremely fertile region. Giant temples are found throughout Karnataka, of course, on the Deccan uplands, as well as in the coastal belt. And I would now like to examine the influence these distinct geographical and climatic situations have had on material resources and building traditions because they directly influence the shape uh, of the uh, temple buildings, as you will see very clearly in the examples in a moment. If we, if we return to the Deccan Plateau and start there, um, here temples are largely made of uh, cut stone. And this can be a yellow, uh, a soft yellowish sandstone or a greenish gray harder granite, which um, others have been made of steatite. It's uh, the same as soapstone or potstone, which is a form of chloritic or talcic schist. And here you can see two prominent examples from this region. 
Um, on the left is the uh, Chamundaraya Basadi on Chandragiri in, um, in Etwana Belgola. It was commissioned by Chamundaraya in about 982 and is a, a Ganga, an early Ganga um, temple, whilst the temple on the right, the Akana Basadi in Etwana Belgola town, dating from 1181, is a Hoysala style temple um, donated or commissioned by a female patron, Achala Devi, the wife of Balala II. The temples follow the typical features of the South Indian temple style, the Dravida style. And as part of this idiom, they have a relatively plain uh, exterior walls. Some have been adorned with pilasters and niches, as you can see in both examples. And the temple's walls are crowned by a prominent um, roof molding, a capota molding, which is topped by a number of ornate elements. And these include pavilions, as you can see here, and uh, horseshoe shaped arches, creating a very elaborate uh, parapet. And the same pattern is then repeated in the roof tower. And here the elaborate composite cornices have been employed in diminishing layers you can see here on the left particularly well, um, to create pyramidal roof shapes. And these, of course, signpost then the most sacred element of the temple, the image inside the shrine below. Here are two more examples. The one on the top shows that the niches can also be filled with decorative elements. Here are these rondelles in the Nagara Jinalaya Basadi, dating from 1195 in Shranabelgola town. And much more rarely, but this is a beautiful example where you can see that there are also Jain temples following this typical Hoysala style of including um, yeah, very uh, ornate figural representations. This is the uh, Shantishvara Basadi in Jinanatapura, dating from the late uh, 12th century. But um, this is a style which is much more common with Hindu temples and uh, the Jain. Uh, temple structures uh, tend to prefer more, uh, more planar, more basic um, facades, which are uh, more reduced. Throughout the region, there are particularly many Jaina temples, which consist of more than one shrine. And these can either be double temples, dweep kutashala arrangements, or more often three shrines uh, arranged in the shape of a three um, petaled clover leaf. This is uh, probably the best known example following this layout. It's the so-called Odegal Basadi, uh, a 12th century Hoysala temple on Vindyagiri at Belgola. And you can see that it's built on a strong slope, um, steep access stairs lead up to a porch. There's a joint mandapa, and then we have one shrine here, one at the back, and one exactly opposite. And whilst um, we just said before that uh, pyramidal Dravida towers are most common in this region, this temple illustrates that there are also examples which uh, have flat mandapa and flat um, shrine roofs. Um, and it's interesting here that because on the uh, dry Deccan plateau, flat roofs pose no problem. We do not need to lead off masses of rainwater. So this is quite possible here. Now, we said that these uh, three shrine arrangements in the shape of a three petaled clover leaf are most common. Now, what you can do is you can add two more shrines at the front to create um, a five shrine arrangement. These are then known as Panchakuta Chala temples. And there is a, a wonderful example at Kambathalli, not very far from Shravana Belgola. It's a, a large complex entered through a gateway. And then we have two facing shrines between which you pass further to the three shrine arrangement behind, which is very difficult to photograph if you're not flying in a kite or you know can rise high up. But I think you can see three of the five shrines here quite well. This uh, was commenced in the late ninth uh, Ganga period by Ganga King Ra uh, Rajamala II, but extended further in the 10th and 11th centuries. Now I'll show you a little bit uh, of the inside decorations. It is very common of Ganga, Hoysala and Talukya temples to have elaborate ceiling decorations, the Vitanas, and these can either be corbelled lantern ceilings, as you can see on the top. This is an example from the Akana Basti 1181. 
Um, they have usually then a lotus pendant projecting from the middle. However, particularly striking, I find, are these uh, square flat ceiling arrangements, which are very common on the Deccan Plateau. Um, they usually consist of nine squares. Um, this is the elaborate ceiling in the Shantinata Basadi at Kambathali, and it shows uh, Shantinata surrounded by um, the eight Ashtadika Palas, who are the eight guardians of the directions of space. Okay, so much to the tradition, temple tradition on the dry Deccan Plateau, our first region. Um, I would now like to turn with you to the wet lowlands of the coastal area. And you will see immediately in the first image, which I'll be showing you that although we are only something like 20 or 40 kilometers um, in linear distance away from the high plateau, the architectural situation is a completely different one. So although the temples on the west coast of this, uh, of which this is an example, um, are also found in South India, they do not follow usually the general South Indian Dravida temple style. Due to the ready, ready availability of wood in the coastal belt and the need to protect buildings against heavy monsoon rains, shrines throughout the region are characterized by having widely projecting sloping roofs. And of these, we can often have several superimposed on top of one another. And this makes them slightly reminiscent of pagoda temples in neighboring Kerala, but also in Nepal and even in the Far East. Now, when comparing these traditions, it's important to, um, yeah, to realize that um, the so um, yeah, you know, the, the temples in uh, coastal Karnataka, Kerala, and Nepal, which look um, or have pagoda roofs are due to a shared um, very wet climatic condition. Um, Kerala is not far from coastal Karnataka, so that's the same uh, condition. And then Nepal is on the slopes of the Himalayas, where again, we have you know, heavy rains um, being discharged, so uh, the clouds can you know, rise over the Himalayan peaks. Um, now, those temples in China, Korea, and Japan, Japan are so-called true pagoda temples, real pagoda temples, which follow an entirely different logic and have been derived from the Buddhist stupa. Now this temple here is at uh, Karkal, um, and um, the steep slanting temple roofs of coastal Karnataka have traditionally been covered with terracotta tiles, as you can see in these images here and the clay for firing is locally available. So we are looking from below into the roofs um, of uh, the Pashvanata Basti at Venur and the Shantinata Basadi at Hiriangadi. And you can see the um, use of wood and terracotta tiles um, making up these roof constructions. Now projecting um, wooden struts or brackets often figuratively carved um, support these widely uh, overhanging roofs. This is a part of the Chandranata Basadi or Hossa Basadi at Mudabidri dating from the 15th century. These uh, overhanging roofs are um, further supported by wooden pillars from below, as you can see here on the side very well in this temple from Padangadi. And the outer walls of the temples are usually plain and traditionally made of wood and mud, which of course creates a very comfortable climate inside uh, the temples. Here you can see much more elaborately carved wooden pillars and ceiling constructions. Um, these, both, uh, these photographs have been taken in the Pashvanata Basadi at Venur. Um, and um, here you can see um, that even when temples have substantially been renovated, obviously with this very posh shiny um, stone in recent years, um, Kind of stone cladding which has been applied to these wooden and mud built temples, the roof uh, or the wood, the, the, the roofs and the wooden uh, elements have often been retained because they are so much part of the local tradition and of course um, are also very impressive and beautifully carved. 
However, over time, and probably as a reaction to stone built temples of the Deccan Plateau, stone was introduced for structural building also to the coastal region. It seems that first basements and also pillars, as you can see here, supporting the wooden roof, were carved in stone to obtain probably a longer durability uh, and also to be able to carry um, heavier roof structures. Due to the scarcity of hard, durable stone in the region, however, it remained a rarer, more expensive building material used for sacred structures only. And this is the roof of the Kere Basadi at Kalkal. In the following, however, also the widely projecting roofs, which are of course indispensable due to the wet climate, were translated into stone. Instead of light terracotta tiles, which we have seen so far, stone slabs here and here, usually made of a local laterite stone, were created. And through this, the roofs substantially gained in weight, as you can imagine. Um, this is the uh, Shantinata temple at Venur and the Chaturmukha temple at Karkal, of which I'll show you a better image um, now. This is again um, the Chaturmukha temple at Karkal, and this is the Chandranata or Hosa Basadi at Mudabitri. Now, as a result of these very heavy stone constructions uh, on the roofs, um, these roofs had to be supported on exceedingly large numbers of pillars um, below, as you can see in both examples. Here, even we have double rows of pillars, whilst normally there's only one row. And due to its large number of pillars, for instance, this Chandranata Basadi in Mudabidri is also known as the Thousand Pillared Temple. I would now like to show you interior photographs of the inside of both temples to show you how the roofs are supported below um, by pillars and how they look from the inside. And you can see that there's an enormous similarity to the wooden constructions which we have seen before. Here really wooden construction techniques have one-to-one -one been translated into a different medium, into stone. And you can see that they're beautifully Carved. So above is the Chandranata Basadi Mudabidri, and below the photographs come from Karkal. Both are, I mean, the uh, Mudabidri temple dates from 1429 and the uh, Karkal example from 1586. So they are sort of 15th, 16th century constructions. It is uh, very common also of the structures in the coastal region to have elaborate decorated ceilings. So here we have quite a close connection to the Deccan High Plateau, but we don't or very rarely have these flat ceilings. They're more likely to have these lotus pendants and to be uh, made uh, or constructed in a core belt uh, technique. Um, here are examples from Karkal, Hiriangadi, and from Venur. Um, Interesting in the coastal region is that many of the temples throughout this coastal belt are multi-storied and accommodate superimposed sanctums on either two here above or even on three superimposed levels as at Mudabidri. Often for structural reasons, I would say the upper floor levels have been constructed in wood, as you can see here, I think it's visible on the photo, this is wooden slanting. Um, and um, or it's a combination of stone and wood with the upper story completely, completely made of wood. And then the roof here is often covered with copper sheeting, which is uh, even lighter than the terracotta tiles and also more precious and expensive. And we have then images on these uh, superimposed levels. Um, for instance, here in Mudabidu, you have Chandranata below, on the second story, we have three jinnas, Suparshvanata, Parshvanata, and Mahavira. And in the very top shrine level, we have um, um, 24 jinnas made of crystal. Or oh, often it's a jinna, as here, for instance, in the Guru Basadi, which takes its origins in the eighth century. We have a Parshvanata below. Um, and on the first floor, we have a, um, a cosmic representation, a so-called Nandishvara Dvipa uh, presentation. It's a, um, a sculptural um, visualization of the eighth continent of the um, Jaina cosmos. 
However, there are also examples where the upper stories have also been constructed fully in stone, as you can see here in Hiriangali, the Shantinata Basadi, and in the Badaga Basadi at Mudabidri, dating from the 15th, 16th century. So then there just needed to be stronger supporting uh, constructions below. Now inside access to these upper stories is provided by wooden staircases. They can be quite simple as here in the Pashvanata Basadi at Venua or more uh, formally um, constructed as here in the Shantinata Basadi at Guru Vayanakere, where also visitors are allowed to proceed up and to view in this instance, again, a cosmological present representation. Now further local peculiarities are the positioning of offering uh, altars and pillars, often in large numbers at the front of the temples. All Basadis which host a car festival who have a rata have a flag post at the front. And this is for instance here the case in the Badaga Basadi in Mudabidri and also in the uh, Chandranata Basadi in Mudabidri. They both host car festivals. Um, and the pillars have um, axially been placed at the front of the temples, either outside the gateways or inside. This is inside the compound. So the positioning can vary a bit. And sometimes we even have a mana stampa and a flag post outside the gateway and then offering um, platforms inside, which are again axially aligned as here in the Sri Padmavati Amanavara Basadi in Hiriangadi. Particularly typical of Jainism, of course, are the mana stampas, which are widespread throughout India, particularly in a Digambara, but at times also in a Shvetambara context. Uh, mana stampas carry um, representations of four jinnas, either seated or standing, facing the four directions of space. This is an example from the Shantinata temple at Venua. But interesting is that um, in Karnataka, and uh, with particularly many examples in the coastal belt, we have other pillars which are known as Brahma Deva stampas or Brahma stampas, which carry an image um, of Brahma Deva who is um, a yaksha, a yaksha is a guardian deity or an associate of the jinnah, but they're also um, kshetra palas, they guard the temple compounds. And uh, Brahma Deva can always be identified by carrying a club and a lemon, a club and a lemon. These are freestanding um, in, um, in Karkal, both from, Kar from Karkal above and from Venua below, from the um, Gomatishra statue enclosures. And the one on the right from Guru Vayana Kere shows you that often very elaborate and beautifully formed um, raised pavilions were constructed around these pillars. So Brahmadeva can be seen here, it's a pillar, and this um, um, four-legged pavilion was raised uh, later to house this sacred um, um, yaksha or kshetrapala. Now, in addition to the kshetrapala on the Brahmadeva pillars, um, a small shrine dedicated to the kshetrapala, the guardian of the temple complex, has also um, usually been placed at the rear left of the temple when facing it. So when you start circumambulating the temple, it's the first uh, side uh, and corner which you reach surrounding the temple. And they look something like this. I'm showing you here four examples. And it shows you also that the Kshetrapala, um, he is not Brahma Deva, but a general uh, protector of the compound is usually shown with a trishula. It can also be a club. Sometimes there is only a trishula and he can be in figural shape um, or also um, shown as a naga. These are naga cults, but they are known as the Kshetrapala. And people say um, that they are identical. It's a figural and a uh, a Naga representation um, protecting the sacred temple complex. And these are examples from uh, Hiriangadi, um, the Neminata Basadi, from the Kalu Basadi at Mudabidri, Pashwanata Temple at Venua, and the Guru Basadi at Mudabidri. But all temples in the coastal belt have at least a simple Naga 
or um, a simple rep representation of the Kshetrapala and in really 99% of all cases in this place. So we've often talked about compounds. We have compound walls surrounding the temples, um, the prakaras, and these are entered through elaborate gateway structures, the mahadvaras. And the gateways, as you can see in all these examples, also do not follow the Dravida design of Gopura gateways, um, typical of the, of the high plateau, but they, just like the temple structures in the region, are um, sloping, have sloping tiled roofs and follow the same design of wooden constructions with tiles. Um, interesting is that these Kanara gateways are usually quite deep. We have spaces, pillared spaces at the front and also to the back, to the courtyard, where people can rest, deposit luggage, where storage rooms can be integrated and often also separate shrine rooms to uh, accommodate more images inside the temple complex. This is the Dera Masheti Basadi Mudabidu. You can also see how beautiful the uh, walls are often decorated. Um, the Shantinata Temple at Venur, and this is again from Hiriangadi, an example. As in other regions of the subcontinent, Jaina temples in Tulunadu have regularly been renovated, repaired, transformed and extended, and sometimes even entirely replaced. Um, in substantially renovated or newly constructed structures, another change in material can be noticed. Whilst temples in the coastal belt were originally made of mud and wood, and at least then at least partially then translated into stone. They can today um, also be fashioned out of concrete or at least um, integrate concrete elements. Here, for instance, the Neminata Basadi at Hiriangadi, um, here the, um, the pillars, the columns supporting the roof have been replaced in concrete. And you can see that also the gateway structure, although there's an old mana stampa, has been substantially renovated. And here on the right, the Chandranata Basadi at Dharmastala is an interesting example of an originally mud, um, wood and clay built temple, which has, uh, was entirely pulled down completely in the 1990s. The images were uh, transferred to a smaller temporary shrine and it has entirely been rebuilt in the 1990s and opened early in the 2000s. Um, it's a concrete construction clad in stone. Okay, to conclude, I'm showing you here two examples of um, aspects which I unfortunately couldn't um, integrate so much into my paper, and this is uh, statues. Um, you know, they're wonderful uh, metal and stone images throughout the region. These are three of the 12 um, statues in the Chattomukha Basadi at Karkal, um, very striking display with the metal uh, plates. And I also have not been able to say much or anything really about rituals. So I'm showing you how very elaborate these rituals, how colorful they can be in the coastal region, particularly this is a Mangal um, ritual with a Kulam uh, design in the Shantinata Basadi at Ludovayana Kere. So to conclude, as the entire lecture series of the Deccan Heritage Foundation has shown in multiple paper presentations over the past months, the Deccan region represents one of the cultural highlights of South Asia. In terms of artistic, architectural, cultural, religious and climatic diversity, exhibiting an unbroken continuity in all these areas to the present day. The Deccan High Plateau is characterized by a hot and dry climate with little rainfall and the availability of hard stone for building projects. On the west coast, the raised lands of the Karnataka uplands descend steeply to a narrow, fertile coastal belt drenched by regular and persistent rains with plenty of wood for building. The architecture of both regions has been adapted to the local climatic situation and the availability of construction materials. Along the west coast of Karnataka, which formed the main focus, it's most interesting in terms of climate and de um, resource dependency, the buildings had to be adjusted to withstand a condition of prolonged and heavy rains. 
This paper has explored the interplay between climate and resource dependency and the freedoms which master architects and artisans working for the local Jaina community in the Deccan still found within these strongly determined circumstances. We have seen an earlier dependency on the availability of only locally available building resources, um, which could later be relaxed, I would argue, due to the building of roads and highways on which good quality stone could be transported over longer distances. And in the modern age, due to the creation of new construction materials such as concrete. The dependency on the climate, however, is non-negotiable. Temple structures made of whatever material were forced in the past and still have today to be adapted to the local climate. May this be a climate of extreme dryness or of heavy monsoon rains. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Hegewald. Um, so. Now, if anybody would like to turn on their cameras, um, please do and, and, and join the conversation. Um, while the questions start to come in, I just want to remind you that I am going to proceed in fielding the questions in a thematic order. Um, and if there are some very detailed oriented questions, we will leave those to the end after the recording. Um, so, um, I just want to start by saying that, you know, what came out in your lecture the most for me was this interplay between wood and stone. And I was reminded of so many examples of that tracing back to Mahabalipuram, for instance, you know, this mm -hmm. such an essential thing in temple architecture. And I wonder whether or not you could tell us more about the ventilation systems that these, you know, that wood and stone may have lent themselves to? Was this also about heating and, and creating a sort of a, a, a space that was conducive to survival or, or, you know, surviving this intense heat? Yes, I think in a way both are very conducive. Both create very um, cool, shaded and cooled environments. Um, uh, wood and mud are of course much easier, cheaper, much easier to handle. They could be handled by people um, building ordinary houses. You didn't need skilled um, um, stonemasons for this. Um, but actually both are very, um, very can, can be very easily vent. I mean, I guess stone temples are even more, you know, even more cool in the winter, in the summer months than uh, the mud and uh, and wooden architecture, but even they create a very comfortable climate, I would say. And um, they probably, you, you, you talked about ventilation. I think they might even be slightly better ventilated because the roof, um, you know, there's sometimes um, kind of ventilation holes or um, it's, it's a more an open construction than the wooden stone roofs, which can really be very heavy and, and solid um, constructions. But yes, you're right in, um, you know, of course, reminding us that the change from wood to stone is something we are aware of generally in Indian temple architecture or also in um, the creation of the uh, Gavaksha niche, uh, you know, from bent wood types to, um, um, you know, via the kind of Buddhist um, monastic cave temples to, to later constructions. Constructions. I think what is so striking is that it takes uh, place so late here in the coastal region that the switch um, seems to happen. I don't know, maybe it started in the 14th century, but I would rather say in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. Um, so um, interesting that wood, just like in Kerala, um, you know, continued to play an important role much longer than in other parts of, uh, of India. Yeah, I, I, I think that that play between stone and wood is just so clear in some of the examples that you showed. Um, and I just, just want to take my license as the moderator to ask you another question. Yeah. Um, is that in your previous work, you've worked so much on cosmologies and hmm. thinking about Jang cosmologies. Is there anything specific about how cosmological representation occurs in the um, coastal temples versus the temples that are more inland, or is it just sort of still sort of this free floating um, 
uh, world, uh, you know, where these iconographies and, and this, this sort of kind of cosmological planning occurs. One might think that the coastal temples might be responding to the cosmos in a different way. So I, I, I just want yeah. to put that out there. I don't want to push for a generalization, no. but I am curious about this issue. No, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting uh, question. Um, what is very striking in the uh, coastal temple architecture is that the cosmological representations almost always, at least all which I have seen so far, um, are stored, are displayed on a first floor level. They're always, they're not on the ground floor, but always on a raised floor level. And that it's very, very often Nandishwara Dweepa, which is the eighth um, continent of the Jaina cosmos, which um, according to the text can only be reached by the, the gods, it's not accessible to human beings. And of course, by bringing them down to a human level and integrating them into a, a man-made temple, they become you know, levels which are not normally accessible, heavenly levels can be made accessible. And I think this is also why they are on a, on a first floor level where um, access can be controlled much more strictly. Um, in most cases, um, non-Jains are not allowed up. It's, um, for instance, at Guru Vayana Keri, it's open. You're very welcome. Anybody can, can move up and, and examine them. Um, in the north of India, I would say we have more cases. Um, I mean, we have instances where cosmological items are integrated into a temple set up with images, but there we have many more examples of strictly cosmological Logical temples, where the Nandishwara temple is the temple itself, for instance. So um, there are, I think, at the moment still some um, differences. It would be interesting to see if over time these uh, large scale um, cosmological temples are also built in the coastal region, which I am so far not aware of. Yeah, I thank you so much for that. So it's, it's a very fascinating issue. So um, I'm going to ask. Um, a question by Kevin Fernandez. If Kevin would like to ask the question himself or himself, please feel free to, but I will read it. Okay. Um, uh, they, uh, they raise the issue of these tiles um, and um, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, would you like to ask your question? Thank you very much. Um, really you. lovely to hear you discuss the temples of the district region I grew up in. Uh, we passed these temples on a regular basis and never knew anything about them. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious about the tiles. Uh, the roof tiles are the Manglo tiles, which were introduced by the Basel mission in the 1800s. Uh, I'm wondering, I, I'd really like to know if we have any access to what was used for roofing before the Basel mission tiles, before the Manglo tiles. Was it terracotta? Was it wood? Um, what exactly was the idea? That's interesting. I actually wasn't aware that the tiles only came in the 18th century. That's quite extraordinary. Um, I would assume that before, I mean, what we find sometimes on very simple local like family temples, which are built on a very low budget, is that we have wooden tiles or straw or such kind of such. Um, and I assume then that this must also have been used earlier on the other temples, which of course would have again given them a slightly different appearance. Um, so I'm really grateful to you for, um, for mentioning that. Um, th that's really an area one should look into with more detail um, when tiles um, were first or whether there were um, predecessors. Different kind of terracotta. Yes, yes. And I'm not, I'm not aware of that, but that's something one should really try to look into. Thank you very much for that, um, pointing that out. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of questions from, um, you know, from Renu Parekh and Kailash Rao and, and uh, Banati Lad asking you to sort of contextualize these temples in comparison to other sites. So, for example, how do they compare to what we're finding in South Maharashtra or how do they compare to what we're finding in Rajasthan or Gujarat? The, just to, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are vast yeah. differences, but if you could just speak a little bit about how these Jain temples are different from other ones in, in neighboring or even distant regions. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, there are actually a lot of um, similarities, um, and I maybe start with those. Um, I mean, the arrangement uh, of space, of having a shrine and multiple uh, halls leading up to them in an axial fashion um, is, is something which is shared throughout uh, 
uh, India. Also, Jaina temples generally often are multi-shrined and multi-storied. So this is something which is actually a general feature which, um, which is not distinct to, um, to the region of Karnataka, although it's interesting that in the coastal belt we have maybe particularly many examples of these double and triple storied temples, which I think might actually be due to the light building fabric in wood and mud, which allowed that more easily also. No? But um, this continued and very pronounced use of wood and tiles um, and mud or then concrete later to replace it is something um, uh, which doesn't continue so long in other regions. As we said, you know, it's such a, it's so striking that into the 15th, 16th century, we still have wood used so prominently in Kerala and Karnataka because it's such a, a readily available and reasonable uh, building material. Now in, um, let's say in, in, in Gujarat, uh, well, actually in Gujarat, we also have, uh, remains of, um, and in Maharashtra, there are wooden temples. Yes, I know now what they what they mean. Okay, I understand. But they are more closely in my, the ones I have seen, um, let's say in, in old, uh, in the old part of Ahmedabad um, or in Nasik, um, um, Ujjain maybe, um, in my view, the ones I've seen, they are more closely related to um, domestic architecture, to residential structures. They blend more into um, the city environment. They often are um, merchant communities who um, build um, wooden temples close to their, in their, uh, um, uh, had, you know, they're in the quarters of their towns where the Jain families live together to have um, places of worship close to their um, residences. And they differ, I would say, from larger pilgrimage sites um, outside the towns, um, Osian or um, Ranakpur, which, you know, are, are wonderful stone built constructions and where um, stone added importance and significance to the temples because it was very uh, expensive and um, time consuming to build them and, and demanded a lot of uh, donations, which is slightly different from, but it's interesting that in the coastal region of Karnataka, um, the wooden temple or the or wood was also employed in really major temple constructions and major temple buildings, such as the Chandranata or Hossa Basadi at Mudabidri, for instance, which is the main, the largest temple in town. And it is also, um, yeah, it's a combination of stone and wood, but um, involving wood where uh, it's not 100% stone as we would typically find at larger sites in in the in central or northern India. Okay, so there's a question from uh, Karthik Mali. Um, Karthik, would you like to unmute yourself? Hello. Hi. Hello. Yes, uh, Hi. Uh, Miss, um, yeah, um, Dr. Hegevold, I'd like to ask you a question about um, the inscriptions of the temples. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I understand, uh, like, um, like in the course of my own work, I had come across some of the inscriptions used yeah. at these Jain temples, and I was struck by a difference in traditions. Um, like a lot of the inscriptions at Hindu temples came from kings or from, you know, like nobles, whereas mm -hmm. uh, with the Jain temples, I think a lot of them were more um, from like priests or merchants and. Yeah. Um, uh, I was just wondering if there's a difference uh, like in like um, information that we can glean from these inscriptions since they come from people uh, closer to the average, uh, yeah. you know. Yes, I would agree inhabitant. with you. Yeah, yeah. They are very, very interesting. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I hope this will. Oh. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to stop this. I can't switch off this phone. I'm really sorry. I hope it will not. Um, it, it's OK if it's important. Uh, hello? OK, we'll leave it. I'm so sorry. Um, no the um, the Jane inscriptions are indeed very fascinating. And they show us that in addition to. Um, Gewalt? 
Ich, bin, ich halte gerade einen Vortrag. Bitte ruf nicht wieder an. Ja, ich äh, melde mich später. Tschüss. <lacht> Super, danke. Jetzt ist es beendet. I'm so sorry. Um, no worries at all. Don't worry about it at all. I can switch off my mobile, but the landline <lacht> is broken. I'm so sorry. Um, um, yes, um, so kings and queens we know um, um, are mentioned in these inscriptions, but you're quite right, Kartik, that we have a lot of references to, um, to priests, to monks, to nuns, to, to lay people, and also particularly many to, to female patrons who donated um, um, either um, uh, money for, uh, for temple constructions or land for the upkeep or, um, or even smaller donations which are recorded um, and give us the impression that um, temple building and temple or maintenance of temples was not an exclusively royal or, or matter of rulers but that in a way um, um, maybe not the lowest, but at least many levels of Jain community or of the community could be involved. And this, I think, also, I mean, added or, or acted as, um, as role models, you know, this idea that dana is, it's important in Hinduism, in Buddhism, of course, but also in Jainism, we have a very evolved culture of, of giving and of um, earning merit, not just for you, but for the wider family, um, this religious bidding, which we see, for instance, around the Mahamastak Abhisheka of being allowed to pour the first, first kalasha, the first pot or subsequent kalashas is something um, which is very ingrained, I think, in, in Jain um, ritual life and allows the laity to um, participate very strongly in aesthetic um, acts of, of giving, of, of, um, of giving up, um, which is so important, of course, um, on the level of, of the aesthetics, but allows also lay people, at least temporarily, to interact very much on this level. And this is very beautifully reflected, I would say, in the inscriptions, showing us that this is not a modern phenomenon, but this, this is really um, about the core of, of Jain, um, practice um, then and now, yeah. So the last Thank recorded you. question, I just want to remind everybody that, that we'll, be, we'll have time for other questions after, but the last question that we will take is from Professor Giles Tillotson, um, who asks, um, would it be correct to conclude that for Jains in this region, region, the desire to assert identity through visual means was less determining, less, less determining factor than climate. Giles, if you want to turn your screen on and, and clarify, please, please do, but um, that's what he's written. Can you okay, I, I, I don't see, I don't see to turn the screen on, but because um, the host stopped it, but I, yes. can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. So I, obviously what I, I have in mind here that there are plenty of cases of architectural traditions within South Asia where the need to assert a particular identity, be it political or religious or uh, cultural, or whatever, actually supersedes issues of climate and um, um, materials and even technology. I mean, there are kind of absurdities where, um, you know, the, the things against the technological um, reasonableness, as it were, in order to achieve something else. And this seemed to feature much less than more practical issues in your, in your presentation and therefore um, I wonder where you would rate it, or, or, or do you think that, that the, the kinds of concerns about identity are so much tied with imperial power, and because of the status of the Jains in, in, in uh, these, in, particularly in the coastal regions, um, that, that, that those issues did not come into play? Yes, very interesting. Thank you very much. I actually, um, yes, one thinks of, um, let's say, the temples in Himachal Pradesh, a region which is also very prone to rain, um, where traditionally the temples would also be more in a pagoda style. But then, of course, we have Shikara temples, which didn't work, so um, roofs had to be attached to them. Yes, great. Uh, Great idea. Um, it's yeah. We we. I'm not aware of a single Jain temple in the coastal. Um, and I'm saying I'm not aware. I'm not saying that there isn't one, but I've not ever seen um, a Shikara Jain temple in the coastal belt, which had to be kind of protected because it didn't quite work. I wonder actually. I have almost the feeling that it has to do with identity, but the other way around, uh, which you seem to indicate. In, in, indicate um, I, I feel that there's a very um, strong local 
feeling. I mean, the people are very proud of being in coastal Karnataka and they feel different about being in this region than the, the High Deccan Plateau. And there is a certain pride, um, I think, that one is different. Um, and I have the feeling that maybe even this local identity was kind of reinfirmed by saying, okay, we use your materials, but we do it our way, um, not through an, a dependency and um, having to do it like this, but possibly wanting to do it like this to look different. I mean, they are very impressive, these temples, aren't they? Um, they look very striking. I find often when people who have not seen them before that, um, they are absolutely flabbergasted that there's something like this could be uh, in India. Um, you know, they, they think of Nepal or of China or whatever. Um, but it is a, a field I would like to think, or a question I would like to think more about. But I have the feeling there is a very strong local identity also. Um, um, the way Hinduism and Jainism are practiced is different in many ways because they both involve very strong Buddha worship, local worship of, of local spirits, which are not really done or not considered mainstream Jainism in other regions. And maybe today sometimes people don't like to speak so much about it or they like to, you know, um, brush it a little bit aside and they don't want to be different. But I think traditionally one probably felt quite strongly about one's regional identity. But it's in, it would be interesting to research more why, you know, why, if it is the case, what I'm saying, um, what, what, what favored this? I mean, why, um, I mean, why this could, um, why this was so persistent. Um, yeah, thank you, that's, that's a very yeah. interesting reply. <laughs> thank, thank you, Giles, nice to see you. Um, and uh, Helen or Abhishek, um, if either of you have questions at this time, um, please chime in, um, otherwise Helen will close the session. Does Abhishek have a question? No, I know we lost. Okay. I think there are many questions, but I don't think there is the time because I think uh, Julia has raised a number of issues which I find fascinating, both building techniques, building forms, how they uh, interpret everybody as a, a, every, every region's identity. These are issues that deserve a lecture by themselves. Yes. Right? So, but thank you for raising all these questions. It was fascinating. Um, I really enjoyed the lecture.